Pleasure to introduce to you our speaker this morning, Reverend Anne Shand, who is bringing you words of truth, of love, and of light, and of joy. Please help me welcome Reverend Anne. Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to a new year, whether or not you are ready for it. <laughs> My heartfelt blessings to you all as we embrace a new year, ripe with the infinite potential of absolute joy, peace, and love, and welcome to those joining us on the World Wide Web. I start with Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into void, into mind, sorry, end of quote. Metaphysically speaking, behold, I create new states of mind, which will produce a new earth of experiences, a new outlook manifest in the new, different and extraordinary. And the past, which no longer serves me, will no longer be entertained in the forefront of my mental field of possibilities. So today, our consciousness will be filled with a life-nourishing flow of divine ideas to sustain us throughout the, this new year. Today, we have been given the ability to initiate a new chain of causation, as quoted from Dr. Holmes' 365 Daily Guides for Richer Living. Mother Teresa reminds us I am a pencil in the hand of God. Today, we surrender to that divine spirit within us as we write a new script for the year 2017. As we consider what it is we want to design or choreograph for this new script, just as a farmer who, when he plants new seeds in a fertile field, we want to be in completely sure what type of seed thoughts that we plant this day. So let us truly focus on just what it is we wish to experience in our daily lives and affairs for the new year. So focus is my theme this morning. So I wish to share an acronym, sort of, but today I'm taking um, license with the English language, but anyway. Focus, F for faith, O for order, courage for C, understanding for you. And then I put it like this. Faith, order, courage and understanding allows us to soar. <laughs> so today, we soar into a new life of excellence, experiencing the beautiful, the true, and the extraordinary. In the execution of flight, you need a fully maintained airplane with a pilot. So today, I invite you to move from the passenger seat to the cockpit, where the pilot is in control. If you have not already done so, now is the time to move forward. Alan Cohen states, and I quote, your personal power is as unlimited as you would have it be. You are under no restriction of age, gender, education, or experience. The only thing that can bind you is your mind, and that is something over which you have total control." End of quote. Dr. Holmes reminds us that the law of mind is our access to that creative genius of the universe. That creative genius that is within each one of us is the channel through which we will engage in order to establish a new chain of causation for this year. So let us contemplate this acronym called FOCUS. FOCUS means the center of interest or activity, the state of having or producing a clearly defined image. We start with F, which stands for faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen." Of quote. Our textbook, The Science of Mind, written by Dr. Holmes, states, in order to have faith, we must have a conviction that all is well. In order to keep faith, 
You must allow nothing to enter or thought that will weaken this conviction. Faith is built up from belief, acceptance, and trust. What is it we believe that allows us to have this stance, this conviction that all is well? He goes on to say, our mind must be steady in the conviction that some, that our life is some part of God and that the spirit is incarnated in us. Not only must we have complete faith in spirit and its ability to know and to do, but we must have complete confidence in our approach to it. We must not be lukewarm in our conviction. We must know that we know, end of quote. And in the words of one of Reverend John's class, class members, we have, must have a sense of noity. <laughs> Pure faith is a spiritual conviction. It is the acquiescence of the mind, the embodiment of an idea, the acceptance of a concept. If we believe that spirit incarnated in us can demonstrate, shall we be disturbed at what appears to contradict this? Dr. Holmes, in one of his papers, he states quite succinctly, faith is a mental attitude. It is not a new kind of underwear or something you eat. <laughs> it is the way you think. Faith is thought moving consciously, definitely for a specific purpose. And if it is real faith, accepting the outcome of the purpose. Faith operates as a law. So he says, it is not enough to say faith can do anything. What you have to do is not only to realize that faith can do things, you have to find out how faith is acquired and then you have to use it for definite purposes. Faith does not spring full orbed into being but grows by knowledge and experience. End of that quote. What is that knowledge though? When we believe that God is all there is and when you have implicit confidence in the law of good, and when you use this belief for a definite purpose, something happens. The reason why that happens is because we are surrounded by a creative power, creative mind, a creative principle, whatever you call it, which actually responds according to our thinking. The truth is we must learn to have faith that we can demonstrate it. And he gives a very, a, a, um, a quote here, which I mean, I, you just turned me on. He says, the supremacy of spiritual thought force over all apparent material resistance. I don't know of any joy on earth equal to that joy. The gratification, not of a sense of personal power, that would not do it. But the sense of the wonder of life, the miracle of life, of the sense of our partnership with the infinite, of the sense that we may put our feet forth into what seems an apparent void, only to find them placed on the rock of ages, end of quote. He's simply saying that that feeling of joy and contentment that comes when we embark on the adventure of observing an idea, a desire coming forth from our thoughts, not knowing the house, but in the depths of our hearts, watching it daily, nourishing it in our thoughts, and suddenly one day, the concrete experience of the manifest desire emerges in your life and affairs. That joy of accomplishment, as we observe changes taking place in our mental thought patterns, the belief, the acceptance, and yes, I want this, with a creeping sensitivity to how I'm going to feel when the outcome appears in my life. The gratitude that allows us to move from unknown intangibles to the tangible evidence right before our eyes. And then that growing trust that yes, this law works. 
This shifts us into a high vibration of possibilities. Yes, the dissolving of the doubts and fears will go away. Certainty and conviction will emerge as all the events and all the other components just fit into place. That is the joy that he's talking about, the supremacy over thought force, over material, material things. James 1, verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James reminds us that we have to do the work, the strengthening of our faith muscles. So in order to do that, let us look at the second letter, which is O, which stands for order. First law of the universe. It means work has to be done to refine our mental field. What is that work? Just as a farmer ensures that he has a fertile field of soil to work with, we have to ensure that our mental soil can sustain, nourish, and give rise to the harvest of our desired outcome. Our master teacher, Jesus the Christ, in the parable of the soil, speaks of this in Luke 8, verses 5 to 8 and 11 to 15. And I quote, A sower went to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. Somehow the Bible has bear instead of B-E-A-R, but B-A-R-E, which means the evidence thereof, the visible evidence of the states of mind. Jesus is really smart, but anyway. Visit, um, verse 11 to 15, the parable, he says, no, like this parable, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. That which fell among thorns are they, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. End of quote. I'm going to use the assistance of the Metaphysical Bible by Herefield and Learn to Live by Irving Seal to look at this parable very carefully in the context of putting our mental soil in order. Now the seed is a word of God which can be interpreted as the desires of our heart seeking fulfillment through us. The quality of our thoughts and thinking styles correspond to the four types of soil surfaces. Firstly, the wayside soil is so hardened by the passage of time. So as the seeds fall on it, the folds of the air are able to devour them because they have not caught root. Our master teacher explains that those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and could be saved. This mental attitude is seemingly unresponsive to any kind of inspired ideas from the, per the individual's own inner connection with God. They live by their own opinions and beliefs garnered from the external world. And their response to anything is always giving you the worst case scenarios, always the negative. They know all the reasons why there are no solutions to any seeming event. Everything that has ever happened to them directs their thought patterns. Totally unwilling to consider other options. And what is more, they are comfortable with their life as it is, no matter how seemingly uncovered, un uncomfortable it may be. The word devil 
is actually lived back when. So they are comfortable with the past fears and prejudices and see no virtue in embracing the future without them. The second mental thought pattern resembles that of stony places where there's no growth, no moisture to, su to support growth. They hear the word with joy and for a while believe and in the time of temptation, everything is forgotten. This correlates to the idealist, seeming emotional individuals who readily respond to every good idea or program of transformation, but cannot sustain the way of life that proceeds from it. When distress arises or any seeming appearance that may require change of thought, word, or behavior, the good ideas program of transformation is deserted. Or when a treatment or affirmative prayer is offered, if the evidence is not seen or felt immediately, it is not working. Even if we are faced with challenges to our abilities and capacities, sometimes we forget that we do have the ability and capacity to change, renovate, and reinterpret. All those good feelings about ourselves are forgotten, destroyed, depending on the power we give to the external events or the effects of life. The third mindset corresponds to the seed thoughts thrown on soil with thorns, which come up and choke growth. The mindset hear the word, go forth and let them be choked with cares, riches of pocket, intellect, and pleasures of life. The operative word here is choke, suffocate, block, congest, restrain, or control. This individual hears the word, but the effects slowly, with the shift of focus from understanding and practicing, or letting the desire demonstrate, get caught up with the external effects and paying more attention to them. Thorns can also mean something has hurt us from the past or even the present. And instead of healing and understanding the role of the thorns in our life experience, we start to seek gratification, satisfaction in the accumulation of riches and the pleasures of life. We get so absorbed in their pursuit, forgetting spiritual principles and practices. Sometimes we are doing the mental work towards demonstrating a desired goal. And incremental evidence of success starts to emerge. But instead of giving thanks and appreciating the change taking place, we get ahead of ourselves. Taking credit for the change, judging all other selves that do not measure up to our approach to life, then something happens. The riches disappear, our image falls, and the buried insecurities push through, and we declare our inadequacies and place ourselves in a state of sadness. Instead of diligently going back to basics, to start a new mental equivalent, the opposite to the one we are feeling. Before we look at the good mental soil attributes, let me say something. If for any reason we observe mental states that correspond to the unresponsive or that which still has mental rocks of guilt, old prejudices, resentment, and unforgiveness, we must continue to work with our spiritual practices and principles that will ultimately destroy and dissolve that which does not serve us. Practices such as meditation, affirmations, and affirmative prayer will remove them. They will allow the new mental equivalence to take root. For the thorny soil, the return to spiritual practices that permit transformation from within to without will always point the way to success. The last mental type is one that fosters successful growth and unfoldment of seed thoughts. This soil resembles an individual with an open, honest heart that sees the good in persons, place, and events. This mind nourishes and is always moistened by good feelings about self, other selves, and their relationship to the infinite. 
This individual understands that enlightenment takes place through experience and will diligently do the spiritual work, place everything in balance and perspective. The seeming appearances of anything other than wise than good will not perturb this individual. Their dependence is on source and they understand the game of life. So we're going to see for courage which is the propensity to carry on the work that needs to be done, physically, emotionally, mentally, and sp while transformation is taking place. Courage is a mindset, and it leads to a way of living. A way of living that is deliberate, resolute, to experience and reveal the truth of one's being. Not content to live with mediocrity, but always diligently striving for excellence. This individual is usually forthright, direct, filled with integrity and unafraid. It is not a life of bluster as a manifestation of strength and power, but it is usually seen when this person in the face of seeming unsurmountables find that inner wisdom rallying all inner resources to seek solutions. It takes courage to take responsibility for one's life path, work out the rough spots, transform what needs to be transformed, dissolve what needs to be dissolved, heal what needs to be healed, and diligently move forward to the desired goal or outcome. Here is a confidence in the significance and the meaning of their life's journey. This life is not one filled with accolades or applause from the exterior but one who moves confidently in the direction of realizing their purpose on this plane of existence. Howard Thurman puts it very nicely. This type of courage is seen in the lives of men and women who do their work from day to day without hurry or fever. It is the patient waiting of the humble man whose integrity keeps spirit sweet and his heart strong. Wherever one encounters it, a lift is given to life and vast reassurance invades the being. To walk with such a person in the daily round is to keep company with angels. To have one's path illumined by the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. End of that quote. The next letter is you, understanding an essential part of focus. What is it we are attempting to demonstrate, achieve, and implement in our lives at this time? Will this desired goal impact our lives in a way that is satisfactory, fulfilling, give us joy and happiness? Friends, the answers can only come from understanding who we are, who is our source, and if our goals are in total alignment to the values of a rich and satisfying spiritual life. These answers can only come from within as we access that creative genius inside, that infinite wisdom and intelligence and listen carefully to its guidance. Then we are able to create, activate and cooperate with unfailing accessibility to that infinite potential within. So as we move forward to this life that we wish to experience for 2017. This fountain head of fresh new ideas will always lead us along the happiest joy-filled journey and destination to our desired outcome. All we have to do is trust the process. It is a law. So during this week, let us look at our accomplishments. Choose four of the best. Observe the method of implementation and achievement in all. Compare and analyze. Then go within to that wisdom and intelligence and check if they need to be refined or changed in any way. And then keep that information to use as you set your goals next week with Reverend John. We have now come to that last letter called S, SOAR. To move to greater heights of accomplishment with faith, order, and place, coupled with courage and understanding, the platform is now set for soaring. 
rising to higher levels of consciousness, higher vibrations of love, peace, and joy. And here's a story from Dr. Holmes to assist us in the soaring. An old minister and a young minister were attending a convention. And the young minister had just finished learning how to quote the 23rd Psalm very beautifully. And so he was asked to recite it to the assembly. He thought his recitation was good, but there wasn't much comment made about it. He had done everything it took as far as appearance and delivery was concerned. Toward the end of the day, the old minister was asked to recite the psalm too. And before he was finished, everyone was in tears. Now the young minister grew up to be a great minister because he went to another person present and said, and I quote, I know all the techniques of platform work. I have a good voice and I have personality plus, haven't I? The other man agreed. And wasn't my delivery of the psalm dynamic? Wasn't it good? The young man asked. The other man agreed that it had been a beautiful rendition. Do you think old Mr. So-and-so read it as well as I did? No, was the answer. Well then, what does he have that I haven't? And the other fellow said, son, he met the shepherd and you haven't. <laughs> so friends, as we look forward to another year, to be, to do, to have, Remember, it can be a beautiful rendition, or it can be a year of being one with the shepherd. That infinite light and love which incarnated each one of us out of itself and imbued us with its attributes of life, love, light, power, peace, beauty, and joy. So let 2017 be a year of faith, order, courage, understanding which will permit us to soar with unbounded joy. Focus. Namaste.